Great, Harry, we can see your screen now. Can you hear me as well? There we are. Yes, we can. Fantastic. Over to you, Harry. Thanks a lot, Tim, and uh, very happy to be presenting here. I've been enjoying the webinar series, so it's a great opportunity to come and talk a bit about what the CLA is doing in this area, which is uh, quite a lot, I hope. Um, so today I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the context and drivers for some of the changes in land management that we're seeing, a bit about how the CLA works and what we're doing to help our members uh, face the future. Um, I'm going to go into a bit more detail about um, some specific policy changes that are coming and other changes as well, and what they could mean, um, and end with a couple of thoughts about um, how we can sort of face the future together as a sector. So to start with, uh, what is the CLA? Um, it is the Country Land and Business Association, as we're now known. So we represent around 30,000 farmers, landowners, and rural businesses in England and Wales. It's a very varied membership. So we have the traditional estates, which may be the sort of stereotypical view of um, what a CLA member is like, but we also have um, smaller farms. Uh, I think the majority of our membership own uh, under 500 acres and many much smaller than that and a lot of different types of rural business as well. So I think if there's any uh, land-based or rural business, something in the countryside, chances are there's a CLA member somewhere who is doing it. Um, so it's a very diverse membership. And what we offer to our members, we have uh, advice from experts in a range of fields, so tax, uh, legal, business, or land use advice uh, free to our members. And I think the other big part of it is influencing decision makers. So we use insights gained from our members' experiences about practical land management on the ground and how policy is implemented. And we use this to feed up to government and others to make sure that uh, future policy is designed in a way that, that works uh, for land managers. And it's also the CLA is a, is a great place for networking, an opportunity to, to learn, to visit each other's businesses or farms, see what other people are doing, share, share what works and what doesn't. Uh, and generally sort of present a, a united uh, face towards people. Um, so I probably don't need to tell people listening that change is coming. Um, I think Brexit is obviously one of the key drivers for a changing policy landscape that's going to affect land management. So we have the Agriculture Bill and the Environment Bill currently making their way uh, slightly slowly given political uh, developments over the past couple of years, but they're making their way through Parliament. And from them stem a whole raft of policies which either directly or indirectly will affect land management in the future. I think there's also there's a wider issue around public um, interest in or, or uh, concern for the environment and particularly climate change has risen up the agenda recently. So as well as the backdrop of Brexit, there's also the climate emergency, the government's commitment to net zero, which is having a big impact. Um, so I think that inevitably change on this scale does bring risks with it. Um, so I think that one of the things I find interesting is that I feel like we were just starting to understand more about how to value land management in a sort of different way, perhaps to traditionally to know about the social and environmental benefits of well-managed land. Uh, you could call them byproducts, but often they're not. Um, but there's a lot of work still to be done on this. And yet, because of the sort of radical nature of, of Brexit and of uh, the policy change, the removal of direct payments and a new trading relationship, I think we probably now need to move a lot quicker, perhaps, down this path, thinking around things like natural capital, social capital, um, than would otherwise perhaps have been the case. I think there's also a lot of thinking to be done around uh, how to make commercial land management profitable in its own right. So I'll talk a bit about that later. And something the CLA has been focused on a lot is around the transition. So we've heard from the government, at least, where they want us to end up um, with post-precedent uh, agriculture and land use policy. Um, but to get from where we are now to there, there's a lot of moving parts. So there's, um, you know, there's removal of direct payments, introduction of the new environmental land management scheme, along with what happens to existing agri-environment schemes and productivity investments. So. There's a lot to, to take place, and I think the CLA's concern has always been that sort of administrative mismanagement of that process could mean that uh, financially viable businesses could come under an extreme economic pressure because of a sort of misalignment of when the old policies are taken away and the new policies are introduced. So we're, we're very concerned that the government needs to, to get that transition right. 
So to talk in a bit more detail about three areas in particular, um, first I'm going to talk a bit about the Environmental Land Management Scheme, the ELM Scheme. I'm going to talk a bit about natural capital and other ways of investing in the environment. And then, yes, yeah, say something more about uh, profitable land use. So in terms of uh, ELMS, we've all heard the mantra of public money for public goods. This is something the CLA has supported for a long time. So we've... Um, we know we've long supported the move towards a public goods based uh, policy. We think it's sort of pragmatic, it's fair, it's good for the sector in the long term at least. Um, and on the slide here, you can see the list of public goods that the government's proposing to pay land managers to deliver. And these map across onto their 25 year environment plan. So I was going to make a few points about uh, the ELM scheme from the CLA's point of view. I think that something that's been quite interesting about the process is DEFRA have called it co-design. So the idea that they they try to involve more people into the actual design of this new policy. Um, I think, you know, formally, particularly when policy was in part, uh, the parameters were dictated by the EU. Um, often it was sort of presented fully formed to farmers to sign up to or not uh, new environmental schemes, for example, um, maybe with a few small number of people involved behind the scenes in the process. Jeffrey have tried to open that up a lot more with ELMS and they've been um, presenting their kind of thoughts and ideas and asking for feedback, which has been at times a slightly torturous process, but I think it's starting to bear some fruit. Um, the new discussion document that DEFRA published earlier this year put a bit of meat on the bones as to what direction they're heading in. But it is a very complex policy. I think when Michael Gove first presented it, he talked about a world leading policy that's never been tried before. The idea of a, a public goods policy where contracts between land managers and the governments for them to deliver environmental outcomes. It is, it is quite complicated and it covers quite a lot of different areas. So inherently there are going to be difficulties, I think, and the CLA is keen to make sure that those are minimized and that extensive testing is carried out to make sure that the policy is fit for purpose when it does arrive. It's also, I think, important to emphasize that ELMS is not a like-for-like -like replacement for direct payments, so you're not expecting the same amount of money to go to the same people under the new scheme. It's an additional income stream, but it is um, payment for the delivery of, of public goods. So as with other operations, so producing crops or animals, um, you are you, you will be paying some money to um, deliver environmental benefits, and we will hope that you get paid at least the costs and additionally a profit on top of that. Um, but it will it will cause some businesses to have to to think differently about what they're doing. Another thing we're considering is how you move from the ambition and principles that the government have set out for what they want ELMS to look like into when agreements are actually signed on the ground will take uh, some time. And so many of our members are asking, what can we do in the meantime? And I think that um, what we've said is that there is some understanding already out there. So we do know, um, we know the, sh the broad shape of ELMS in terms of the types of things that, the types of public goods that will be needed to deliver. And looking at uh, existing schemes and evidence and science, we know roughly what uh, farmers and land managers can do to deliver things like wildlife habitat, clean water and other public goods. And we've also said that um, people should consider joining countryside stewardship. I think that came up on the Slido answers. I think um, Elms is not going to be here until 2024 at the earliest, except for the pilots. So we're saying to people that countryside stewardship, which is a far from perfect scheme, but has been improved over the years. And the fact that it's now under UK government control allows for further improvements and sort of reducing the complexity. So. It offers a potentially stable income stream and the government have guaranteed that anyone who does enter a countryside stewardship scheme will be guaranteed to be able to not uh, enter an ELM scheme if they have that opportunity later down the line. So we think that probably means allowing to break their CS contract early if they've got a better opportunity through ELMS. Um, and something else I think you can do now is uh, start to collaborate, start to, to think about your local area, your neighbours, the community, because I think that's all going to be quite important for ELMS of thinking about what you could deliver in collaboration. That seems to be uh, one of the watchwords for the new scheme. So thinking about how you might do that um, as a land manager is something you can start to do now. Um, so I think it's important to say that ELMS is not the only game in town. So while it's important, there are other pieces of the jigsaw that need to be 
uh, got right. We obviously have a, a trade deal that needs to be in place. We have um, improvements to countryside stewardship. But also, um, I think that it's important to think about agriculture and other land uses such as forestry and how they can be made to be profitable in their own right. I think without direct payments, the profitability of agriculture is going to be put under the spotlight. So the CLA has provided a business adaptation program, which we think should come in as soon as possible, ideally now, which should be a package of support for farmers to consider their options, look at their business. Um, it could include uh, capital investment, grants, training, skills, advice, everything we can do really to ensure that as direct payments are removed, businesses are able to adapt to the future. And that needs to be, as I say, in place um, too. And I think to make um, agriculture and food production particularly profitable, um, there may need to be some fairly radical thinking as well. And I think that the national food strategy that Henry Dimbleby is undertaking is one opportunity to think more broadly about the food system as a whole, about what it delivers, about the values it has, um, and about the whole supply chain. So one of the other areas the CLA has been uh, heavily involved in is, is sort of picking up speed at the moment um, is around uh, environmental investment of other types and natural capital particularly. So we see natural capital as a new way of thinking about the value of land and the assets on land and also a framework for making decisions about land management, uh, sometimes by thinking a little differently about what's on the land. Um, so I think those benefits from land management that I mentioned before, the environmental and social benefits that uh, accrued by people, sort of not just the land managers themselves, they need to be recognised more widely. And if this happens, that could bring uh, public and private investment opportunities to people who might be prepared to pay for those, for those outcomes or for those benefits. Um, so who might make those payments? Um, I've already touched on what the government might do. I think that uh, it's been talked about in a previous um, webinar, but biodiversity net gain, which is something the Environment Bill introduces, is another opportunity. Uh, water companies have been doing this for some years now, but you know they know that to meet some of their objectives in terms of water quality, for example, it's often cost effective for them to pay land managers to do this land management, basically. Um, flooding is another issue. I think it's going to become more important as climate change starts to bite and businesses at risk of flooding or the, those who insure those businesses are again starting to think a bit more differently perhaps about um, how to prevent flooding, how to lower that risk, which again can sometimes be done through uh, different ways of managing land and that could be paid for in the future. Um, I mentioned uh, food production, the supply chain. I mean, we already see some examples of essentially consumers being prepared to pay a bit more for food if they think it's been produced sustainably uh, through leaf or organic schemes, for example. So I think you're starting to see some of that idea that paying for food that's been produced by people who have good stewardship of the land could uh, command a premium. Uh, carbon credits, I won't say a huge amount about, but I mean, it's a big issue, especially with the government commitment to net zero. And then a few more innovative ideas of, of again, how we use land, green prescribing. So it's increasing evidence of the health, mental health and well-being benefits of being outside, being in green space and in nature. And the health service is starting to think more seriously about this and indeed prescribing people to go outside and spend time uh, in nature. Um, which could be beneficial for those people who are managing that land. And that final box, I call it corporate investment. It could be called green finance. There's a whole sort of raft of ideas that are fairly um, at the early stages right now, but it's about how businesses and how the financial sector think about the environment. Uh, that could be about the risks uh, in their supply chain. It could be about their own environmental impact and how to minimize or offset that. Or from the financial sector, it could be about how to facilitate some of this, so how to um, facilitate carbon trading or biodiversity uh, habitat banking, for example. So just to end, I was going to cover um, what, what needs to happen next and what I think that we could do as a sector. Um, I think that the sector needs to work together. I think this um, uh, land management 2.0 uh, thing has been very interesting to see all the different voices out there. But it's also important to remember that not everyone's at the same stage of thinking. So the CLA represents a very broad range of land managers. And while some of the most sort of entrepreneurial forward thinking people might be 
looking at the opportunities I've mentioned and thinking there's something there for them. There are others who may be more anxious, more less clear about what they need to do and more worried about the future. So we need to be careful about those who are risk, at risk of being left behind and think about how we can advise them as a membership organisation, but also how the government and other parts of the private sector can develop in a way that accounts for different types of farms, different types of land managers. I think the government does need to continue its direction of travel, but also to be mindful of the pace and the scale of change that's coming and think about carefully about that transition uh, and the sort of the risk of unforeseen consequences if it's done thoughtlessly. Um, we need to continue to promote recognition of the benefits of good land management. So that's the economic benefit. So the CLA has a campaign called the Rural Powerhouse, which is talking about the productivity gap between the rural economy and the urban economy, and that if that gap was closed, it would be a, a big benefit to the economy as a whole, but also the social and environmental benefits that I mentioned. So the more people realize that good land management produces a whole range of benefits, the more likely they are to take it seriously to invest time and energy in it. And finally, I think land managers and landowners need to think about their assets and their businesses carefully. I think that sustainability and the green agenda are definitely here to stay and everyone should be taking that seriously. And given the change that I've talked about, um, having a sort of diversity of income streams, diversity of, of contracts is going to be very important um, for, the, for those businesses to have resilience. So thinking a bit differently about, about land than maybe you're used to is something that I think is going to be increasingly important for businesses. And I will end there.